No, this is class notes. So guys, again, books open to chapter four. Piece of paper or two to scratch some notes on. Something to write with. We're going to get started. Okay, you guys with me? Chapter 4 starts on page 115. Okay, so guys, do this. Oh, um, well, actually, yeah, we should do this. So the topic for your notes today is actually precipitation reactions. The date today is the 26th, if you want to you know, organize your notes chronologically. But guys, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a sense of how we're going to tackle the rest of this unit. Um, some of you have already started into outlining chapter four. If you haven't started to outline chapter four, you're about to get a sense of why doing these outlines ahead of time are a good idea. Um, because as we go into a new chapter, it's nice to get a sense of the overview. But because these aren't due till Tuesday, we'll do it together. So guys, Page 115, I know we already talked about this. Chapter 4 is all about aqueous reactions, right? Which means they're happening where? In water. Okay, so as you slowly page through chapter 4, you will notice that when we talk about reactions in water, we've got to talk about some fundamental ideas about what do things do when they go into water. And fundamentally, either they dissolve or they don't. But if they do dissolve, there are different ways that things dissolve. So the first few pages of this discuss what happens when things dissolve in water. Then when you get over to page 101, it starts to talk about what things do dissolve in water and what things don't dissolve in water. And of course, that leads to the solubility rules. Then as you page past the solubility rules, it starts to talk on page 122 about something called ionic equations. That is where we are going to end today. Um, and that is then going to take us, guys, through page 124. Then when we get to 124, we are going to spend a day and we're going to talk about acids, bases, and neutralization reactions. That will be Tuesday. Then when we go again and you continue to go back, we then hit page 131. That is oxidation reduction reactions. That will be Thursday of next week. So we'll do redox reactions the following Thursday. Then I should see you on Monday, um, but I won't because it's Labor Day, right? Um, so then back to page 139, when I see you the following Tuesday, we will talk about solution concentrations, dilutions, and um, titrations. And that will round out the unit, the chapter and the unit. And that means your test will be the Thursday after Labor Day over chapters three and four. Does that make sense? Three and four. We did chapter three last time. We'll wrap up four and four, four days. Yeah. So guys, again, today what we're going to do is we are going to talk about some fundamentals about what happens when stuff dissolves in water. And then we're going to talk about net ionic equations. And that's how we're going to wrap up the day. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and understand that's a good, so Brandon's saying, wait, as we're outlining these chapters, we're not supposed to understand it. And the answer is yes. And it's one of the fundamental differences between high school and college. As you go through chapter four, many times what I'm going to ask you to do is actually write down the things you don't understand. And then that becomes my job description is to help you understand those things. In college, the understanding is you read it, you understand it. And if you don't, you better read it again. 
So understand, I'm not expecting you to learn from this. I'm just setting the stage so you have something to refer back to. Okay, so guys, here we go. Uh, we're going to dig into the beginning of chapter four. You can put your books aside now. You don't need them. Unlike the way we handled chapter three, we will never again just page through a chapter and let that drive the process. So you'll always bring your books to class, but seldom will you need them as we're learning new material. So guys, we are now going to dig into aqueous solutions. Aqueous, of course, means uh, based in water. And when we talk about aqueous solutions, you are going to find out that there are two types of aqueous solutions. And guys, this is going to get a little nutty. I've always thought that it would be interesting to turn this into like a dichotomous key, um, and I've just never done it. But what you're going to find out is we're going to talk about the two types of solutions, and then we're going to talk about the types of types of solutions, and then we're going to talk about examples of the types of solutions. So I'll do my best to help you figure out sort of the family lineage for these things, and I think you'll figure it out as well as you go. So when we talk about fundamentally big picture, the two types of solutions, they shake out like this. The first are what are called non-electrolytes. These things do not conduct electricity. And guys, that's what it means to be an electrolyte. An electrolyte simply means a substance that conducts electricity. So I know Tyler's, you know, drinking tons of water for football. And you know if you're an athlete that a lot of times that they have you not just drink water, but they have you drink electrolyte sports drinks. Gatorade. It's the first electrolyte sports drink. But guys, all that it means to be an electrolyte sports drink is it means it conducts electricity. Why is that good for us? Because our nervous system is basically just an electrical system where the currents, our nerve impulses, are conducted by, by, by uh, salts dissolved in water. These salts become a part of our nerve, our nervous cells, and that's what conducts the electricity. And if we run out of those salts, our nervous system can't conduct electricity well. We short circuit and we cramp. Because that's all it means to be an electrolyte is simply something that conducts electricity. So here's what you need to know about non-electrolytic solutions. First of all, the salts are, or I'm sorry, the solutes are soluble. Can we review really quickly? In a solution, there's two parts, a solute and a solvent. The solute is the thing that's being dissolved. The solute's the thing that's doing the dissolving. So in a non-electrolytic solution, the solutes are still soluble. Stuff is still dissolving. If that doesn't make sense to you, you may want to write that down. Stuff still dissolves. But the trick is this stuff does not form ions in solution. Let's review. What are ions? Pause. They're charged particles. Hold on. And because it doesn't form charged particles, it does not conduct electricity. So guys, fundamentally, the idea is this. In order for something to conduct electricity, it has to have charged particles. If there are not charged particles, it will not conduct. So in a non-electrolytic solution, stuff dissolves, but it doesn't ionize. It doesn't form charged particles. And because that's the case, it doesn't conduct electricity. So guys, now let's talk about it. What are things that dissolve in water, but don't form ions and therefore don't conduct electricity? Electricity. Let me give you one example, and I think this will make sense to you. Sugar. Sugar is a non-electrolyte. Sugar water does not conduct electricity. Does sugar dissolve in water? Absolutely. But when sugar dissolves in water, it does not break into ions, and as a result, it doesn't conduct electricity. And guys, this is true of all molecular solutes. So let's review again. What does it mean to be a molecule? What kind of bonds do molecules have? Ionic or covalent? Covalent. So we are talking about the covalently bonded substances like sugar. 
your head's about to explode, right? Because for you to understand any of this, you had to remember solute and solvent. You had to figure out that it's necessary for ions to be present for a solution to conduct. Then you had to remember that molecules contain covalent bonds. Sugar is an example of a molecule. And you now know that when molecular solutes dissolve in water, they break apart, but they don't ionize and therefore they don't conduct electricity. Good stinking heavens, right? Guys, I think this will make more sense when you see the videos. Uh, you saw these in general chemistry last year, but when I bring you back to them, I think it'll make sense. But let's talk about electrolytes now, and then we'll bring this full circle. So guys, the other type of solution that you need, the, well, the other type of solution is an electrolytic solution. So guys, electrolytic solutions, again, have soluble solutes the stuff still dissolves. It has to dissolve. But the trick is this. When electrolytic solutes dissolve in water, they don't just dissolve, they ionize. They form charged particles. And when they form charged particles, these charged particles provide mobile charged things and because they're charged and because they're mobile, current can pass across them and you end up with a conductive solution. An example of this would be table salt dissolved in water. But guys, all ionic solutes conduct electricity. All ionic solutes are electrolytes. All the salts. No exceptions. Nope, they all conduct electricity. So guys, let me ask you an interesting question. Does table salt dissolve water if it's not, I'm sorry, does table salt conduct electricity if it's not dissolved in water? It does not. Why not? Are there ions? Yeah, so Matt, why not? No, they're ions. Go ahead. Yeah. But that's always the case. So you have the positive ion and you have the negative ion, but they're, I mean, together, since they're bonded together, they're not mm -hmm. the water, they, they have it dissolved, and they're still, uh, the, the, I guess the ions cancel each other out. That's a wonderful idea. It's actually wrong. Um, no, but, it, but let's talk about why. So the, the idea is this, and I'm just going to draw with my finger. I agree with you that if you've got salt, you've got NaCl, NaCl, and these things all cancel out, right? But if you dissolve these in water, they break apart, but there's still equal numbers of them. So the charge is still neutral. So why does solid salt not conduct electricity? Let me bring you back to this. What can't the ions in a salt crystal do? Move. Guys, in order for a substance to conduct electricity, it not only has to be charged, it has to be mobile. And when you have a salt crystal, when these, when these ions are locked in place in the lattice, you're right that the charges cancel out, but they're still charged. They don't become more or less charged when they dissolve in water. What they do become is mobile. In a, in a solid, in a crystal lattice, they can't move and therefore they can't conduct electricity. It's when you dissolve them in water that they can move around and it's at that point that they can conduct. Let me, show you, let me show you a video. So guys, this is the idea then. We now understand that there's two types of solutions. Solutions that do not conduct electricity, we call them non-electrolytes. But you gotta be careful here. In a non-electrolyte, does it dissolve? Yes, it still dissolves. We're not talking about sand. Sand water does not conduct electricity. But the reason is because the sand doesn't even dissolve in the first place. We call that non-soluble. 
So everything that we're talking about here does dissolve in water. But some things, when they dissolve in water, the non-electrolytes, they break apart, but they don't break into ions. Those don't conduct electricity. Then there are the substances that when they break apart, they do fall into ions, and those are the ones that do conduct electricity, and we call them electrolytes. So guys, let me show you what this looks like on a molecular level. So remember this from last year. Here we have water in a flask, and in we drop. Do you see the cube go in? And guys, this is a, uh oh, I can't click like that. It freaks out. Um, what did I do? Hold on. Let me just go back. Okay, so here we go. And we drop in the cube. I got to click here. So we're dropping a cube of salt. We're dropping this into the water. I love that they kept the colors straight. You guys all understand that sodium is not gray and chlorine is not green, right? Okay. And as we zoom into this, here is our two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional crystal lattice. But it's surrounded by water molecules. And what are these water molecules, what are the water molecules in a cup of water doing? They're moving around at hundreds of miles an hour. Remember the mosh pit analogy? They're running into each other. They're running into the walls. Some of them have enough energy that they're flying out of the top of the beaker, which we call what? Evaporation. They are going nuts. And so when you drop a salt crystal into a cup of water, that salt crystal gets the crap beat out of it. Water molecules are just thumping on this thing like crazy. This is not nearly as violent as it actually is. But guys, here's the other thing you've got to remember. Remember polarity? Water molecules are polar. Why are water molecules polar? What are they not which makes them polar? They are not symmetrical. Because they are not symmetrical, they are polar. The oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, making the oxygen the negative dipole, the hydrogen's the positive dipole, and these things are like little magnets. They've got a negative end, they've got a positive end, kind of like a north and south pole, and the negative end and the positive end are attracted to the positive and negative ions. And because of that attraction, these water molecules latch onto these ions and carry them off into solution. Now, guys, let me see if I can pause this. Do you notice how they're different? Look at the way the water molecules are oriented around the chlorine compared to the way they're oriented around the sodium. What do you notice? They're backwards. So, guys, this sodium is positive. So which end of the polar water molecule is attracted to the positive? The negative, and that's the oxygen because it's more electronegative. You'll notice that the chloride is negative, and therefore the positive dipole at the hydrogen end is attached to the chlorine. And literally, these water molecules come along, grab a hold of these ions, break the ionic bonds, and rip these ions off into solution and they surround these ions, the water molecules surround these ions, and they cause them to dissolve, go into solution. But now what we've got is free moving ions. These water molecules are carrying these ions throughout solution, and now we've got free moving charged particles, and that allows an electrolyte to conduct electricity. Do you get the idea? Okay, now let me show you the rest of the video because I skipped this last year. So now we're going to zoom out. Oh, it's still in there. It's just dissolved. Now, guys, we have what's called the conductivity meter. Um, it's basically a battery with a light bulb and two, and two uh, leads. And when you stick these leads into the water, a current, if a current can flow between these two leads, then the bulb will light up. So when we shove this in the salt water, will the bulb light up? 
what is conducting the electricity, not the water, the ions in the salt, and it will in fact light up. Got the idea? Okay, so now let's play the same game, only now instead of salt, in goes sugar. And now we'll zoom in. And guys, this sugar is C12H22O11. And I know that this is hard to visualize, but let me explain what we've got. We still have a lattice. You understand that sugar is a crystal. But at each point in the lattice, instead of alternating positive and negative sodiums and chlorides, at each point in the lattice, you've got a big old honking sugar molecule. It's huge. It's 12 carbons in a ring surrounded by water molecules. Remember carbohydrate, right? So guys, this is a big old organic sugar molecule, and there's one of them at each one of these places. Now, if that's true, we no longer have ionic bonds holding this together. What is it that keeps the sugar molecules locked to each other in this lattice structure? Intermolecular forces and they're weak and because they're weak they're easy to break that's why sugar melts at a much lower temperature than salt but so now we've still got a crystal but at each one of these points we've got a big old polar water mo or a polar sugar molecule instead of a positive and negative sodium and chlorine ion well in comes the waters and these water molecules are also attracted to the sugar molecules the sugar molecules are polar, the water molecules are polar, the water is attracted to the sugar. But guys, imagine this is a sugar molecule. When the sugar molecule gets carried off into solution, it's not the bonds inside the sugar that's breaking. What is breaking when sugar dissolves? the intermolecular forces between the molecules. And because we are not breaking the bonds inside the molecules, we are not creating charged particles. And so when these sugar molecules go away, they go away intact. None of the covalent bonds inside the molecule breaks, and therefore we don't create charged particles, and therefore sugar solutions and other molecular solutes do not conduct electricity because we're not breaking the bonds, we're breaking the intermolecular forces in the crystal structure. You get the idea? Absolutely, or it would be non-soluble. Yep, and so now when we zoom back out and when we test, when we put the conductivity tester in there, will it light up? No. no. Now guys, and I think you understand, this is not going to light up, but the question is why? Does that mean there's nothing dissolved in the water? No, there's sugar dissolved in the water. So why doesn't dissolved sugar conduct electricity? Because it doesn't form ions. Do you get the idea? Do you see the difference? Guys, that's an important concept. Let's pause and answer questions if we need. Is okay? Uh, Go ahead. Okay. So the difference between the salt and the sugar is one forms ions, the other doesn't. Correct. When it forms the ions, mm -hmm. it's the salt. Uh-huh. It makes it conductive. Correct. Yeah, so and and it's an it so the so why 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 does salt form ions and why doesn't sugar? So guys, it's, let's talk about this because it's a really important question. You guys have all heard the sort of the little saying that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? So when things break, they're going to break at their weakest point. And so if you have a salt, this is now salt, and if you have a salt crystal. Um, the place where this is going to break is the only place that it can, which is the ionic bonds. Now imagine this is sugar, okay? So now this is no longer sodium and chlorine. This is sugar molecule, sugar molecule, sugar molecule. And when you start to pull on a sugar crystal, it's going to break at the weakest point. So where's the weakest point? Is it the covalent bonds inside the molecule or is it the intermolecular forces that hold them together? 
And the answer is the intermolecular forces that hold the crystal together are weaker and that's where it breaks. So when you pull the sugar molecules apart, the molecules stay together because the covalent bonds are strong. The intermolecular forces break because they're weaker. Let's not go deeper. That's all you need to know. Okay. okay. So guys, you good with that? All right. So now look at what I just did. What are we going to talk about next? Electrolytes. So remember what we did. We started with non-electrolytes and electrolytes. Which one conducts electricity? Electrolytes. So what are we about to talk about? We're going to talk more about electrolytes. So guys, understand that we are now digging deeper into this family that we call electrolytes. Because it turns out that when we talk about electrolytes, there's two different types of electrolytes. There are what we call strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. So let's define strong. So strong electrolytes are substances that completely ionize in water. They completely break apart. Table salt, when you put it in water, it completely dissolves until you add so much that it's saturated, and we'll talk more about that later. But guys, strong electrolytes completely ionize in water, therefore they are strong conductors of electricity. Contrast that with what we call weak electrolytes. Because weak electrolytes only partially ionize in water. Instead, what they do is they reach equilibrium. And as a result, they are only weak conductors of electricity. Now you're going, oh my gosh, what does that mean? I'll show you. But guys, before I show you what this means, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you examples. You need to know what are the things that are strong electrolytes, what are the things that are weak electrolytes. Then I'll show you another video that will help you understand the difference between strong and weak electrolytes. You guys all caught up with me? You okay? Let me, let me make a suggestion. As you're taking notes, do you have, like, you just wrote this stuff down, right? Do you have a bunch of, like, empty space over here on the right? Is it fairly empty over there? If it is, this would be my suggestion. I'm about to give you the examples, the, the strong and weak electrolytes that you need to know. Um, I'm going to do it on another page of notes. But if you just want to write in the examples, maybe in the white space, maybe that would connect them for you in your brain. So guys, these are the things that you need to understand are strong electrolytes. This is the list. The things that are strong electrolytes are all soluble ionic substances. But guys, you already know another name for those. What do we call ionic substances? Salts. So we are talking about all of the soluble salts. So guys, if a salt dissolves in water, it's a strong electrolyte. What if it doesn't dissolve in water? Then it's non-soluble. It's not a weak electrolyte, it just doesn't dissolve. So salts are either yes or no. Does it dissolve? Yes, it's a strong electrolyte. It completely ionizes. Or no, it doesn't dissolve, and then it just sits on the bottom. So how do you know which ones dissolve and which ones don't? You memorize the solubility rules, right. But guys, there's actually another type of strong, another type of soluble ionic substance. That's the strong bases. But guys, technically, they are all salts. 
lithium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium cesium, all of those, they're all hydroxide salts. But I know in your brain, you think about them a little bit differently, so I included them as a different category. But guys, technically, all the strong bases are salts. But all the strong bases are also soluble. So they count as well. And then, guys, the last thing that you need to know, which is a strong electrolyte, are all the strong acids. But, guys, you'll notice that I did not put the strong acids underneath ionic substances. The strong acids are not ionic. They're molecular. HCl is not an ion. It's actually a molecule. All of the strong acids are actually molecular. We'll talk more about that. Strong bases are ionic salts. The strong acids are all molecular. They're actually all gases. They're all molecular gases. Okay, then guys, what about the weak electrolytes? The weak electrolytes are the weak acids. And you guys realize that you've accidentally memorized all the weak acids, right? Because if you're given an acid, and if it's not one of the seven that you memorized, guess what? It's a weak acid. You can do that by process of elimination. Then also the weak bases. And we have not talked about this yet, but guys, the weak base that you need to know right now is NH3, ammonia. Mm. Ammonium is NH4+. Plus. This is ammonia and it's NH3. And then guys, finally, I just got to let the cat out of the bag, but we're not going to talk about this now. We'll talk about it later in the year, but here's the deal. Go back up to strong electrolytes. What are the strong electrolytes? A lot of them are salts. So if you've got a salt, either it does dissolve in water and then it completely ionizes and that's a strong electrolyte or it doesn't dissolve and then it just sits on the bottom. You guys okay with that idea? Well, guess what? There's actually another kind of salt. We're not going to, we're going to talk about this in like March. Guys, there are salts that we call them slightly soluble. They dissolve a little bit, but they don't dissolve completely. They are weak electrolytes. We call them the partly soluble salts. We're going to pretend like now like they don't even exist. In our world right now, salts can only do things, dissolve or not. And if they do their strong electrolytes, and if they don't, they don't dissolve and they sit on the bottom and do nothing. We'll talk about the slightly soluble salts later in the year. So guys, let me help this make sense for you. Y'all caught up? Okay, strong and weak electrolytes. We're going to watch this video twice. I'm going to let it play through the first time, and then we're going to chunk it up and talk about it the second time. So it goes like this. This could be really loud, or it could be really quiet. Hydrogen chloride is a colorless gas, which is soluble in water and benzene. First, pure water is poured into a beaker. Water has a very low conductivity, and the bulb remains unlit. When hydrogen chloride gas passes into the water, it dissolves, and the bulb shines very brightly, showing that the solution is conducting. Ions form because water behaves as a base, accepting protons from the hydrogen chloride. We get the hydronium ion and the chloride ion. In the last part of the experiment, we are using a weak acid, acetic acid. We pour 0.1 molar acetic acid into the beaker. And the light bulb glows less brightly, showing that the solution has only a small conductivity. Acetic acid is a weak acid and is only slightly ionized in water. Okay, now let's go back through and pick this apart. Hydrogen so first of all, this is HCl. This is hydrochloric acid in its molecular form. Remember how I told you they're all gases? This is a container of HCl. 
chloride is a colorless gas, which is soluble in water and benzene. For okay, now here we go. So what we've got is we've got the flask of HCl, the tank of HCl, we've got the light bulb, and then over here we've got the wires and the power supply, and then I know it's hard to see, but this is the beaker, and in that beaker they actually have the two electrodes, just like the animation with the two electrodes, right? Okay, now, they're going to come along, and in this flask, do you remember what's in there? It's just water. First, pure water is poured into a beaker. Water. Okay, so let's stop. This beaker is now full of water. Does water conduct electricity? No. Why not? What is it missing? Doesn't have any ionized particles. Guys, water is H2O. It's not H plus and O minus, it's H2O. Water is not a charged particle. It doesn't have positive and negative ions and therefore it doesn't conduct electricity. So why do they kick you out of the swimming pool when the lightning storm comes in? Because if you get hit, you're gonna die if you're in water. It's the stuff in the water. Guys, there would be nowhere safer for you to be than in a big old pool of distilled water in a lightning storm. Distilled water does not conduct electricity. It's all the stuff dissolved in the pool that makes it dangerous. So guys, when we pour this water in there, it doesn't conduct electricity because water is a non-electrolyte. It's a molecule. It doesn't conduct water. It doesn't conduct electricity. It has a now, very low conductivity and the bulb remains unlit. Okay, now they start to bubble HCl through the water and the HCl actually reacts with the water and it breaks into H plus and Cl minus. As it dissolves, it actually breaks apart and it ionizes. Now we've got H pluses and Cl minuses. Now we have charged particles in the water and what does that do? It conducts electricity. When hydrogen chloride gas passes into the water, it dissolves and the bulb... Can you see that bubbling over there? Yeah. yeah. Let's keep going. Hold on. ...signs very brightly, showing that the solution is conducting. Ions form because water behaves as a... Don't worry about this part about water acting as a base. We'll talk about it next week. ...base, accepting protons from the hydrogen chloride. We get the hydronium ion and the chloride ion. In the last part of the experiment... Okay, process of elimination. Now we've got a new acid. This is acetic acid. Is it weak or strong? How do you know? Because it's not strong. Now, if you didn't understand this, guys, acetic acid is actually vinegar. So when you buy a, a bottle of vinegar, it's about... And it tells you on the bottle, I think it's typically about 10%. So a bottle of vinegar is 10% acetic acid. You can actually convert that to a molarity, but it's hideous. Um, but now guys, acetic acid is not a strong acid. So when we put this acid into the flask, what's gonna happen? Well guys, let's talk about the chemistry and you don't need to write this down, but acetic acid is actually CH3COOH. And what acetic acid does when it goes into water is it forms, it forms hydrogen ions and it forms acetate ions. Now here's the trick. These acetate ions are very reactive. And so what these acetate ions will do is they will actually grab back a hold of these hydrogens and they will drive the reaction in the other direction. What do we call that? Equilibrium. And what ends up happening is in this solution, not all of this breaks apart. So in a weak electrolytic solution, some of the ions that are formed actually bond back together and turn back into the unionized product. Now guys, does this stuff conduct electricity? Why not? It ain't charged. 
this stuff does conduct electricity. And so guys, because this doesn't completely ionize, we don't have a ton of charged particles floating around in solution. And as a result, it conducts. It just doesn't conduct very well. We are well. using a weak acid, acetic acid. We pour 0.1 molar acetic acid into the beaker and the light bulb glows less brightly. Now guys, let me ask you a question. Remember, this is the chemistry that's going on inside that flask, right? Where is the unprotonated, where is the unionized acetic acid? Where is it in this picture? It's dissolved in the water. Guys, you've got to understand this. Weak electrolytes completely dissolve. All of this dissolves. It's not sitting at the bottom of the beaker. All of this is dissolved, but not all of it is ionized. Do you see the distinction? So weak electrolytes do completely dissolve. They just don't completely ionize. You may want to include that in your notes under weak electrolytes. Weak electrolytes do completely dissolve. They just don't completely ionize. All right. So guys, let's review really quickly. We now understand that there's two types of solutions, electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Non-electrolytes do not conduct electricity. Why? Because they don't form ions. What kind of things don't form ions? Molecules. Then we've got the electrolytic solutions that do form ions and therefore conduct electricity. But there's two types, strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. Strong electrolytes completely ionize and they conduct electricity really well. What things are strong electrolytes? Strong acids, strong bases, and soluble salts. Then we have the weak electrolytes that do dissolve. They just don't completely ionize, and as a result, they don't conduct electricity as well. And the things that are weak electrolytes are the weak acids, the weak bases, and then you're going to find out the slightly or partially soluble salts, but we're going to deal with those later. Anything there you want to talk about? Because we're about to shift gears. Go ahead, Mark. So the last demonstration, Yeah. Uh, yes and yes. So all of the IMFs are breaking because actually acetic acid vinegar in its undissolved form is a solid. It's a crystal. And so all of the intermolecular forces break when you make the solution because it's all broken apart. But then, yeah, the covalent bonds inside of those molecules are breaking to let the hydrogen go away. Yep, go ahead. That's a great question, Mark. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, if you could like stick the probe in that. If you could, yes. Yeah. It would charge on its own without the water. Is that correct? It would not conduct electricity. Because the HCl, the H's and the Cl's are bonded together. They're not ionized. In. So if you could stick those probes inside that tank of HCl gas, it would not conduct. But the combination of the H2O and the HCl, that's what, that's what ionizes it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You guys okay? So guys, we've got about 20 minutes left and this is how we're going to wrap up the day. If you remember from chapter three, we went over this part that talked about patterns of reactivity, reaction types, and we had uh, combustion, synthesis, and decomposition, right? What did we miss? Single and double displacement. The reason that it doesn't mention single and double displacement is because single and double displacement reactions actually are always aqueous reactions. So they belong in this unit. And so guys, what you're going to find out today is that double displacement reactions tend to be acid-base reactions or precipitation reactions. That's what we're about to do. Then it turns out that single displacement reactions tend to be oxidation reduction reactions, and we're going to talk about that in a couple days. So with that said, precipitation reactions are reactions which form 
precipitates. What is a precipitate? It is a non-soluble product from a chemical reaction. Now, guys, you remember this, right? You've done dozens of precipitation reactions. Remember that lab we did with all the little squirt bottles and you mix them back and forth and you were looking for the precipitates to form in the bottom of the micro well? Remember that lab from last year? Yeah. Do you remember that magic moment when you figured out where all of those reactions were double displacement reactions? Maybe you made that connection. But this is review, right? You knew what precipitates were, right? Okay, so guys, with that said then, we're gonna skip this video because we did the lab last year, and now we need to talk about how we're going to approach this. So here's the scoop, and please don't write this down. This is conversational. Bottom line, guys, is in order for you to understand precipitation reactions, you've gotta know what things precipitate. To know what things precipitate, you need to know what things do and don't dissolve in water, and that all comes back to the solubility rules. So guys, if you wanna grab your solubility summary charts, go ahead and do that, but we're not gonna go over them. And understand that these have gotta be committed to memory. What we are going to do is stress test them. We're gonna figure out whether or not yours works. So guys, this is the way we are going to round out the rest of the day. Now, did any of you print the notes? Okay, what you're going to find out if you do print the notes is there's three more pages of notes left, but we are not going to go over the last two pages of notes. They are there for your benefit if you get stuck and vapor lock over the weekend trying to do your homework and you forget how all of this works. So I'm gonna show you how to do this with the understanding that actually there are two pages of notes if you need to go back and look these things up. So guys, this is how we are going to represent uh, uh, precipitation reactions. You do wanna write this down. So guys, all precipitation reactions are what we call double displacement reactions. And when we write these double displacement reactions, we will not only write and balance the equations, we will also include subscripts. So guys, here's what you're gonna do. If you're getting down to the bottom of your sheet of paper, flip it over. You're gonna need about a third of a page and you want it to be continuous. Actually, you know what, that's not true. You need half a page to do what we're about to do. Okay, so guys, here's what we're gonna do. Together, I'm not gonna turn you loose on this. Together, we are going to write the balanced equation for this reaction. And here's what it tells us. It tells us that one molar lead to nitrate solution reacts with 0.5 molar potassium iodide solution. Now guys, let's think. What do the molarities tell us? How concentrated they are, right? But the underlying idea is, it tells us those things dissolve in water. Anything with a molarity has to dissolve in water because if it didn't dissolve in water, it wouldn't have a molarity. So look for clues like that. If you don't know whether or not lead to nitrate dissolves in water, look for a molarity. If it's got one, you know it's got to dissolve. Did y'all get this written down? You okay? All right. So guys, I'm going to go white and we're going to do this together. So do this with me. So one molar lead to nitrate. 
So lead to nitrate is P oh, is P B N O three two. And this is reacting together with potassium iodide, which is KI. Now this will be a double displacement reaction. So who does the lead hook up with, the potassium or the iodide? The iodide, and this will be Pb, I2, and then our final product will be the potassium and the nitrate. Why is it KNO3? Because the potassium is plus one and the nitrate's minus one. Now let's balance it. One lead, one lead, two nitrates, one nitrate, so we need a two, one potassium, two potassium, so we need a two, two iodines and two iodines, and that balances. Okay, now we gotta start thinking. We need subscripts. So, does lead two nitrate dissolve in water? How do we know? Has a molarity, what if we did, what we know from solubility rules? This dissolves in water, so that would be AQ. What about potassium iodide? It also dissolves in water, that would be AQ. Now, what about lead 2 iodide? Does it dissolve in water? It's a violation of the solubility rules. All halogens dissolve in water unless they're bonded to certain forms of silver, lead, and mercury. This is one of those forms that violates the rule. This is actually a solid. And then all nitrates dissolve in water, so that would be aqueous. Okay. Now, guys, here's what I want you to do. I want you to skip down five lines in your notes. And I want you to draw three beakers. I know this is low on the board, but I think you'll pick up the details quickly. Here's what I want you to do, guys. In the left-hand beaker, we are, and I'm gonna just do this with you. I'll do the first one with you. In the left-hand beaker, we are going to draw this. What does it mean if you've got a beaker full of whatever molar lead to nitrate? In the middle beaker, we are going to draw this. What does it mean that you've got some molarity Ki? What do you actually have in the beaker? And then in the final beaker, we're going to draw the products after we've mixed them together. So guys, what's going to be in here? In this left-hand beaker, if we've got a beaker full of lead nitrate solution, do you all understand there's no lead nitrate in a lead nitrate solution? What's actually in there? Water, and we're not going to include the waters, but what's in there? Lead ions and nitrate ions. So guys, inside this beaker, we're going to have lead ions and we're going to have nitrate ions. But what's wrong with what I just did? It's twice as much nitrate. It's one lead and two nitrates. Guys, there is no lead nitrate in, in lead nitrate solution. This is actually completely impossible because when it dissolves in water, making it aqueous, it breaks into lead ions and nitrate ions. So now do the second beaker. What's in a Ki solution? What's in there? What do you got in here? We got some K's. What's the charge of K? Positive. And we got some I's. And that's negative. You ain't got any KI in KI solution. You got K's and you got I's. Potassium iodide, potassium ions and iodide ions. Yeah. Yeah, because we're not going to worry about the stoichiometry right now. We will in a minute, but we're not going to worry about it now. So now, guys, here's what we've got to do. And actually, Rebecca, you're going to see that we will do that up here. So now, guys, what we've got to do is this. If there ain't any of this, and if there ain't any of this, 
We've got, to, we've got to rewrite this equation so it actually represents what's in the beakers. So here's what we're going to do. There isn't any of this. There's actually PB2 plus and there's two NO3 minuses. We just wrote down what's actually in that beaker. You are writing what is called a complete ionic equation. And in the other beaker, there are actually, and Rebecca, here's what you were asking about, there are Ks and there are Is, but there's actually two of each proportionally because of the balanced equation. So if you would prefer to write two in there, that would be fine. Okay, so now these line up. Now let's talk about the products. Guys, look over here on the right side of the balanced equation. Do we have any of, and so the idea is this, we're going to like mentally dump these both in here. So we're going to take both of these and we're going to dump them together and let them react, just like in lab. So guys, do we have any lead to iodide? Yeah, why? It doesn't dissolve. So in the bottom, we have got a pile of PBI2. That stuff does not dissolve. It precipitates. And that's how we draw precipitates is a pile on the bottom of the beaker. Now, guys, what about the potassiums? Where are they? Floating around in solution. So, guys, we've got how many of them? Two. And then what about the nitrates? Where are they? Floating around in solution. So we've got two nitrates. Do you get the idea? So now let's rewrite the second side of the equation. Guys, PBI2 really is there. Just write it down. But now what about the potassium? No, the potassium exists as ions and the... Oh, the nitrate also exists as ions. So now, guys, let's think about this big picture. This is what we started with. We started with this, and we started with this. We had lead floating around, lead ions in solution, nitrates in solution, potassiums in solution, and iodines in solution. So now let's look at the before and after picture. Lead started out floating around in solution. Where did it end up? In a pile on the bottom. Nitrate started floating around in solution. Where did it end up? Floating around in solution. Potassium started floating around in solution. Where did it end up? Floating around in solution. Iodide started floating around in solution. Where did it end up? Pile on the bottom. Do you understand the sad result of what we just did? Only half of these guys got to do chemistry. The other half of these dudes just sat around and watched. So guys, so guys it, the, the lead, lead gets to do some chemistry. Yeah, yeah, it, it started in solution, solution and it ended up in a pile. Did the, the, the nitrate, nitrate get to get to get chemistry? chemistry? No, no, it started, it started in, in solution, solution and it ended, it ended up, up in solution. And as, as a result, we are going to, going to cross it out. It, out. it, is, it what is what is called a spectator, a spectator ion. ion. Now, now, guys, what about, about potassium? potassium? Potassium started, started in solution and ended, ended up in solution. Did it do the chemistry? chemistry? No. no. It, it is a spectator ion. ion. Now, now, what about the iodide? The iodide, the iodide, the iodide started, started floating around in solution. Did it get to do some chemistry? chemistry? Yeah, yeah, it ended up in the precipitate pile. pile. So guys, now what we can do is this. We can take this and we can get rid of the stuff that we rewrote or that we crossed out. And when we do that, we end up with this. And that represents the chemistry that actually took place inside the beaker. 
the potassium and the nitrate were just hanging out watching the fun and we call them spectator ions and as a result we cross out the spectators. Now guys let me give you the names for these. This is what is called a complete molecular equation. This is what you are accustomed to writing. The next one down is what is called a complete ionic equation. Complete ionic equations break the strong electrolytes into their ions. Then, guys, what do we call the red dudes that we killed? Spectator ions. So the red dudes that we killed are called spectator ions. And when we remove the spectator ions from the complete ionic equation, we ended up with this. Just a second. And this is what is called a net ionic equation. And guys, here's the deal. In AP chemistry, you will always only write net ionic equations. You will never represent spectators because they never do chemistry. Quickly, you will learn to write these without having to go through the process. But for now, we will do net ionic equations in any way we can. So guys, with all of that said, check this out. Here are all of your notes on molecular equations, complete ionic equations, spectator ions, and net ionic equations. If you need any of that, feel free to check the notes. Here's your homework. I'm going to stop recording.